Medical Monday is proudly brought to you with the compliments of Discam. Pharmacists to care. And good morning to you. I'm Kathy Kayla, and this is the Discam uh, Medical Monday. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll be your host for the next hour. You know, when uh, when one has children, I think that we take so much for granted in terms of how easy it can be. And I say that fully cognizant of the fact that it is not easy for many, many, many people. You know, as a uh, as I start having more and more conversations with with uh, people around fertility, I am astounded at how many people are actually undergoing treatment. So uh, we've called in our expert, Dr. Yossi Unterslack. He is a he's a gynecologist, but he also is a, he's a fertility assistant at Vita Lab, and we're going to be talking this morning about. Uh, fertility and issues around fertility. I'm inviting you to engage if you've got any questions. And uh, Dr. Unterslack has actually said that he's willing to take any any questions around gynecology. So uh, how do you get in touch with us? Well, you can uh, SMS on 34519. 34519, that's the SMS line. Those SMSs are charged at 1 Rand 50. You can uh, tweet at Chai FM. How do you spell Chai? C H A I F M. You can email on air at Chai FM dot com, or you can WhatsApp from anywhere in the world, absolutely free. So uh, let me give you that number. The South African code is plus two seven six two one four eight. Two three seven four. If you've missed that number, you can get to chaifm.com or any of our social media play pages. So, um, with that, let me introduce Dr. Yossi Unterslack. Good morning, and thank you so much for coming. Good morning, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Are we becoming more infertile? Not necessarily that we're becoming more infertile, um, but what we do know is that women are delaying starting their families quite considerably. So women are far more career-orientated these days, and um, the longer we wait to start our families, the more difficult it can become. So we're definitely seeing an increased number of people requiring fertility treatment, but probably mostly related to, um, to age. age. and not necessarily that people are becoming more infertile as time goes on. And uh, generally, is it men or women who have the fertility issues? So in our practice, we see roughly, um, we call it the thir a third, a third, a third. We see a third of our patients who have a primary female pathology. Yeah. A third of our patients will have a primary male, male pathology. And then a third of our patients will have a combined factor. Um, so it's a very, very mixed picture. And a lot of the times we'll sit with a couple who um, the female may have a significant issue. And then we test the male and we find that he's got a sperm factor as well. So... It, 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 it's, it's not, um, there's, there's, no, there's no hard and fast rule, but we generally see our, our couples having a third female, a third male, and a third combined factors. This isn't about gender equality. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I ask the question is that, you know, I think we've all seen those, those articles, and especially we're in November, it is, uh, it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. So we've all seen those articles, underpants too hot and you're wearing satin boxes and this doesn't work and that causes infertility. Are those things true? So there's very little that, um, that, that will cause a severe male fact infertility, you know, underwear, hot baths, things like that contribute. So if a male has an issue with his sperm, these kind of factors will make things worse. But having hot baths, spending too much time on a saddle on a bicycle um, does not make a male infertile. We get it a lot from our couples where the female will tell her husband, see, you have to get out of the saddle, stop riding your bike so much. But it, these things don't cause male infertility. And then he but takes they certainly, golf, yeah, so. <laughs> And then she never sees them. <laughs> yep. But it definitely contributes, um, it def it, and it can worsen a male fact infertility. So... Um, I guess my 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 answer is if if a male's got completely normal sperm, wearing tight underwear, having hot baths, and riding a bicycle is not going to make his sperm weak. But if a man's got you know a, a mild male factor, these kind of things can make things it's worse. It's already diminished. It, it could actually have an impact. Yeah. Okay. Great answer. Um, what is a normal sperm count? What is considered? normal parameters okay so uh, you know there's there's a couple of criteria that we look at um the one um, the one thing that we look at is the concentration of the sperm so how many how much how many sperm are there in a mill 
of 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 you know of, of semen. So concentration we look at, and that would be around 15 million per mil. Then we look at um, the motility of the sperm. So it's not not good having a lot of sperm if it's not moving hard and fast in the right direction. So we look at concentration of sperm, sperm, and then we also look at the shape of the sperm. Sperm are made up of a head, a neck, and a, and a tail, and um, we look at abnormalities in the head, the neck, and the tail of the sperm, and. Um, What's, what's, what's very interesting is that um, the testicle makes a lot of sperm, but it makes poor quality sperm. So only 4% of that total ejaculate will be normal shaped sperm. So anything 4% and above would be normal, and less than 4% would be pathological. So when you show a guy's see semen analysis and he's only got 4% normal, he's, you know, um, he thinks his world's coming to an end. But that would actually be a normal um, morphology or normal sh- shapes um, count on, on a semen analysis. So percent of 15 million. Of 15 million, exactly. Of <laughs> so it's a lot of sperm. So it's not good having one or two normal sperm in an ejaculate. You need a good high concentration of normal sperm, normal shaped sperm that are moving hard and fast in the right direction. So um, th- there's a couple of things that, that, you know, other things that we look at when we, when we look at a semen analysis, but those are the basic parameters which you, which you look at, which would classify a male as subfertile or or having a normal fertility. You said uh, that there was one third um, of your clients, a woman who who have the infertility issue, one third male, and one third, you know, where the couple has got an issue. Can we talk around that? Sure. So uh, we 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 know that. Um, strong female from a fertility point of view will compensate for um, a borderline male fertility. So if a man's got a a, a slightly low um, count or his morphology, the shape is slightly low, the female can compensate up to a point. But when a female has some pathology as well, then the two together create a bigger issue. So for example, if a woman's got endometriosis or if she's got um, older eggs that don't cope as well then she then then the male factor becomes more significant so for example we'll often have cases of couple who come to see us and he may be in a second marriage and he easily fathered children in a previous marriage and now they're struggling and we'll test his sperm and we'll find you know that he's got a male factor and obviously the first question is but I've got my own children you know are those really my children and oh, um, okay, <laughs> so, and that's, so that's a very, difficult, in, yeah. very <laughs> difficult question to answer but we um, so, so we see these kind of things that um, you, that it becomes more significant when you've got some female pathology um, and you know the, the, the laws of, the, of attraction in this world is that often the the woman who's got, unfortunately, pathology contributing to infertility s- t- seems to attract the man with very poor sperm, very uh, low sperm count. So that's kind of what we what we often see. And um, it does make things a little bit more challenging. But thankfully, today we've got incredible technology that allows us to overcome these Can things. Can I actually hear? You know, before it was, we only spoke in terms of, um, or generally, you know, when you spoke about fertility, it was generally in terms of the numbers of of sperm and that uh, that concentration of healthy sperm, it was ne- uh, you're the first um, fertility expert that I've ever heard say, you know, there's three different segments to a sperm and you have to look at each of those, which is uh, it just shows you how far we've yeah. come in terms well, of technology. Yeah, there's there's a, there, there are a couple other parameters that I'm not really discussing because they're very technical, but um, yeah, you can have a male who's got a completely normal semen analysis on a piece of paper. Can't can't get his wife pregnant, and when we put those eggs and sperm in a laboratory, we can um, we, we we then see that the sperm for some reason can't bind to the egg and can't fertilize the egg. So there are lots of hidden parameters that you don't see on an, an analytical test like a semen analysis, which we see in the laboratory once we start working with the sperm and the eggs. Incredible. I'm speaking to Dr. Yossi Onderslack. He's a gynecologist. He's also a fertility assistant at VitaLab. Uh, if you've got any co- comments that you'd like to make, if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask, please do so. And how do you do it? Well, you can uh, SMS on 34519. You can email on air at chaifm.com. You can tweet at chaifm. It's uh, at C-H-A-I-F-M. Or you can WhatsApp from anywhere in the world for free. Our WhatsApp number is plus two seven. That's a South African code. 062-148-2374. And if it's from South Africa, it's 062-148-2374. I'm Kathy Kayla, and this is the Diskim Medical Monday. Medical Monday is proudly brought to you with the compliments of Diskem. 
Pharmacists Who Care. I'm Kathy Kayla and thank you so much for joining me. We're talking fertility this hour and if you've got any questions, any comments that you'd like to make, please do so. There's a number of different ways that you can get in touch with me and uh, you can SMS 34519 if you're based in Johannesburg or you can WhatsApp zero uh, six two one four eight two three seven four if you're in Joburg. If it's international put the two seven in front plus two seven six two one four eight two three seven four. If you've missed any of these numbers get to our social media pages, get to highfm.com and uh, you'll be able to get that number there. My guest in studio, Dr. Yossi Unterslack, he's a gynecologist and he's also a fertility assistant at Vita Lab. Now uh, Let's just talk about the causes of male and female infertility. So let's start with the guys. Okay. So very often male infertility is just the way a man's been born. Um, we, we, there's been a lot of studies that have looked into lifestyle changes, that uh, whether they improve sperm, etc. And we, what, we, what we find is that very often um, the factors that contribute to male infertility is that a male's been born the way th- that way. So in other words... The testicle's been born to only uh, the, the testicle's been made that it can only manufacture so much sperm to a point and no further. So he has a low count, for example, or maybe the testicle create makes sperm which is um, poor quality, doesn't move as well, the shape's abnormal. So often that's just the way the man's testicles have been made, and. Um, Unfortunately, that's very difficult because there's not much we can do to change that. We have the technology available to be able to give him children, um, but we, we can't make we can't change the sperm to such a degree that he is now able to um, fertilize an egg, you right. know, in vivo in the body. And we would need to do things in vitro in the laboratory. There are certain factors that contribute to so certainly lifestyle, um, obesity, um, substances, um, so narcotics, alcohol, things like that certainly contribute. Um, you mentioned type underwear and sitting in a hot bath and we know that heat is not a good not good for sperm so a male who's had a fever for example and we test his sperm later his quality will be will be will be poorer than than it normally is so heat is a big factor um and there are certain things which contribute to, to, to creating a hotter environment in the scrotum, things like varicose veins in the scrotum, which will cause an increased temperature and then um, contribute to, to a poor semen analysis. So um, there are certain factors that are correctable, but most of them, unfortunately, are the way they are, and we have to work around with what, work around what we have. Um, obviously, losing weight, cutting out substances, etc., does improve the semen analysis to some extent. Um, but often not enough to, um, you know, make it make it normal again, if you'd like, normal right. in inverted commas. So, so those are the big factors for as far as male infertility. Obviously, there's sexual dysfunction, which contributes quite significantly to infertility. Um, you know, for, so for example, erectile dysfunction or condition called anejaculation, where you know the um, um, uh, intercourse is is not possible for the male, and then we would have to intervene from that point of view. Um, there's what is that? What is the intervention? No, what oh, is so, an ejaculation? Okay, so an ejaculation is a man who's able to achieve an erection but unable to ejaculate. So, okay. so it's usually a psychological um, thing, but there are certain um, medical causes of it. And these couples, you know, would need assistance either um, extracting sperm directly from the testicle or um, uh, getting the male to ejaculate under general anaesthetic with the use of certain electrodes, which we're not going to go into. It's quite scary. But um, we, we do have ways of, of, of getting that sperm if, if we need to. So people so, I know who, who want children who can't have children will do anything absolutely and that's the truth of it yeah absolutely um so 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 yeah so sexual dysfunction does contribute to to the group of male infertility have you looked at genetics um sure there's many genetic conditions that that cause male infertility so um there are certain chromosomal abnormalities if a man's born with an extra x chromosome so an xxy and has 47 chromosomes something like clinefelders will live a pretty normal life but will be infertile, so when we test his sperm, he will have no sperm in his semen. In, in his semen. So there are certain genetic conditions, um, chromosomal conditions. There's things like cystic fibrosis, which if a male is a carrier sometimes or, he, or is affected by cystic fibrosis, um, he will have male infertility. But often that contributes to um, what we call obstructive um, azospermia. So azospermia is where a man has no sperm. Um, if he's got an obstructive azospermia, which means the testicle makes the sperm, but the sperm's got no 
way of getting out of the testicle, it's quite easy to rem- remedy in that we can go and extract that sperm from the testicle, as opposed to the group of patients who have no sperm at all. Obviously, that that, that that's a much more difficult uh, what about illnesses? problem to deal with. Illnesses, um, you know, uh, somebody who at I don't know age seventeen gets mumps Excellent. or one, so, of, one of those. So that's a good question. Is it so, mumps? So, so, yes, so, Is uh, it mumps absolutely. That, that so can post, post, male post pubertal mumps can certainly render a male infertile. So prepubertal mumps, not necessarily, um, or, or doesn't, but postpubertal mumps can. It doesn't mean if you've had mumps post-puberty that you will have no sperm. But we, a lot of our patients who do have no sperm have had mumps post-puberty. So... Um, Certain infections can. Uh, repeated sexually transmitted infections also can cause obstructions, um, which lead to, to male fact infertility. Gosh, this is so involved. But I'm, I'm very happy that you're here because clearly you, you, know, your, you, know, your, you know your stuff. <laughs> okay, so let's look at some of the causes um, of, of female okay. infertility. So the female obviously is, is a little more complex because the male's just got the testicles and, and, and that's the factory for the sperm. And the female... Uh, the female's got emotional. <laughs> <laughs> there is that as well. So, so we started, you mentioned emotional. So there's obviously sexual dysfunction related to infertility with females as well. Um, you know, certain syndromes that cause a painful vagina, which a woman is unable to, to, you know, to have intercourse and would need to get, you know, conceive um, with either insemination or, or IVF. Very difficult thing to treat. So psychological, a lot of psychological um, treatment. Um, there are certain drugs which can, which can, um, you know, help. But often patients, patients like this cannot conceive naturally and need to either have insemination or, or IVF if it's very, very severe. Um, so that's, that's the one group, obviously. And then when we look at female infertility, we divide it up into the uterus, the ovaries, and the fallopian tubes. So we know that the ovaries produce an egg each month. The egg is then caught or passed to the fallopian tube where it's fertilized inside the fallopian tube, then travels along the fallopian tube and settles in the uterus to become a pregnancy. And you can have a pathology anywhere along that path. So the fallopian tube, most common cause of infertility in developing countries, usually caused by repeated um, infections. Um, And when we have blocked or abnormal fallopian tubes, the cure for that is generally IVF. So these patients need to have in vitro fertilization. Um, The uterus pathologies, women can have things like fibroids, which are benign growths inside the uterus. They can have polyps, which are benign growths inside the cavity of the uterus. These things can contribute to infertility or subfertility. And the biggest challenge for us are the ovaries. So a woman is born with her eggs inside her ovaries. They're assigned to her... A lifetime supply. Exactly. In her mom's womb, she's assigned a lifetime supply. It's not a lifetime supply, unfortunately. It's a reproductive lifetime supply. Yes. When those eggs run out, the reproductive um, life has, has, has essentially come to an end. And that's our big, biggest challenge with women because men have stem cells in their testicles. We're constantly producing new sperm in our testicles. And a woman's eggs will run out eventually. And there's no way to regenerate a woman's eggs. And when they run out, unfortunately, she cannot conceive anymore with her own genetics. And we have to look at things like egg donation, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, so two things happen as a woman ages. Number one, the eggs run dry. So the ovary runs dry of eggs and they get fewer and fewer and fewer. And um, the other thing that happens is can the eggs age. Can that happen before menopause? It, it can happen before menopause. So, so menopause is quite a wide range from yeah. an age point of view. But we see young 21, 22, 23-year-old girls who have reached perimenopause who are going into menopause, often related to certain genetic conditions or autoimmune conditions. But we have young girls who are going into menopause as well. So the eggs run out and also the equality diminishes as we age. So 25 um, at, 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 tw- at 35, you have half the chance of falling pregnant that you did at 25. So a woman ages quite quickly from a reproductive point of view. And often the ovaries are not the same as the chronological age of the woman. So the ovaries age independently of your age. So you can be 30 but have 40-year-old ovaries, which poses a huge challenge for us. A woman who feels young and is still young and has decided to now start her family, but when they come to see us because they're not falling pregnant, her body we says see that her ovaries have aged quicker. And I always use my bald head as an example. We're all, <laughs> we're all, we're all programmed to age at different rates. And the top of my head aged by the time I was 25, 20 it looked like I was 50 and some women's ovaries age quicker than others and by the time they're 30 their ovaries are sitting somewhere in their 40s I'm sorry to tell you this but you still don't look like you're 50 <laughs> <laughs> but I think we get your point we, okay. get, we get your point I'm speaking to Dr. Yossi Unterslack we're talking about fertility and uh, 
yeah, an infertility. He's a gynecologist. He's a fertility assistant at VitaLab. And uh, if you've got any questions, I'm inviting you to uh, to get in touch. Would it kill you to write? No, it wouldn't. So uh, how do you do that? You can SMS us on 34519. Uh, if you don't want to mention your name, then just sign it anonymous. Uh, you can also tweet at Chai FM. Unfortunately, that's not going to be anonymous. You can WhatsApp us. And the WhatsApp number, if you're dialing from Johannesburg, is 0621482374. You can also WhatsApp for us from anywhere in the world. Uh, just add the South African uh, code. So it'll be plus 27621482374. And uh, we'll take your questions right after this. Medical Monday is proudly brought to you with the compliments of Discam, pharmacists who care. I'm uh, Kathy Kayla. Thank you so much for joining me for this Discam Medical Monday. I'm speaking to Dr. Yossi Unterslack. He's a gynecologist. He's also a fertility assistant at Vita Lab. We're talking about infertility. If you've got any questions, he is the guy to ask. And uh, I'm telling you, you can hear, you can hear how incredibly, incredibly knowledgeable he is, male or female. If you don't want me to mention your name, I certainly won't. Um, you can just sign it as a non or just put somebody else's name. I'm not going to know the difference. So uh, 34519 is the SMS line. That's how you get in touch. Or you can uh, WhatsApp us. And the WhatsApp line is 0621482374. All right, so we were talking just before the break. I just want to get our listeners up to speed if you've just joined us. Um, causes of male uh, infertility, it could be genetic it could be obesity, narcotics, um, alcohol. It could be varicose veins, which causes uh, heat around the the, uh, the scrotum, I That's think right. you said. See, I was paying attention. Um, and that can actually result in much lower quality sperm. Um, it could be a case of sexual dysfunction. It could be a case of something called an ejaculation. Uh, now we're looking at different uh, reasons for or different causes of infertility in females. So um, Dr. Unterslack was saying sexual dysfunction, there could be the woman could have fibroids, polyps, um, ovaries. You know, there could be problems with her ovaries, but all along the route, because, you know, the mechanics, the plumbing, so to speak, right. um, is much more complex than a man's plumbing. Okay, so uh, can we just talk about endometriosis? Sure. Okay, so endometriosis... Because that's one of the other causes. Yeah, it's an interesting topic because many, many women fall pregnant with endometriosis and have no problems conceiving. But a great percentage of our patients who have infertility also have endometriosis. What's endometriosis? So endometriosis essentially is that inside the uterus, the lining of the uterus is made up of, of tissue called endometrium. This is specific cells that under the influence of estrogen every month will build up. And then when a woman has a period, those cells will be sloughed, the lining will bleed out, and that lining will start to grow again the following month. And that's the endometrium. Now, endometrium should be just there in the cavity of the uterus. But for some reason, we find these cells migrating outside the uterus. So we can find them inside the muscle of the uterus. We can find them sitting on the outside of the uterus, lining the fallopian tubes. We can find them deep inside the ovarian tissue causing endometriosis cysts inside the ovaries and in actual fact some women have a nosebleed every month when they have their periods so that's how, how far these cells can migrate um, when I was when I was studying we had a young patient who used to bleed from her one eye every month with her period so these cells can be found anywhere in the body God, that's adding insult to injury exactly Jeez. and um, that's four days at home n not because of your period pain but because your you're bleeding, bleeding from your eye yeah. so endometriosis is a really scary disease because these cells can migrate anywhere and what they do essentially is they cause an environment in the pelvis which is not conducive to conception. So they give off certain chemicals, they create a, a, an environment inside the fallopian tubes which alters the, 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 the environment which is, which is good for fertilization of egg by sperm. So we have lower fertilization rates, number one, and then we also have a decreased implantation rates. So you may have fertilization in the fallopian tube, but the embryo doesn't implant in the uterus because of endometriosis, either in the, in the pelvis in general or in the muscle of the uterus. The other thing that endometriosis does is causes scar tissue inside the pelvis, distorts the functioning of the fallopian tubes, and then the tube's unable to pick up the egg every month when the woman ovulates and fertilization can't take place. Unfortunately what we see a lot of is infertility related to unnecessary surgery 
because of endometriosis. So what a surgeon will do when he sees a woman with endometriosis is rush her to theater and operate. And that's not always the best way to manage endometriosis. Very few people need to be operated for endometriosis. There's a place for surgery to manage a woman's pain if she has really severe pain. Um, if she's got really large endometriosis cysts inside her ovaries, she needs to have surgery. But very often endometriosis should be and can be managed medically, especially a woman who's not trying to conceive. And a woman who's trying to conceive Medical management is not an option because most of the medical options render will, 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 will cause a woman not to ovulate. So we can't offer medical management to a woman who's trying to conceive, but we should offer medical management, especially to our young girls, our teenage girls who are presenting with endometriosis. And the first thing the surgeon wants to do or the gynecologist wants to do is take her to theater and operate on her. And then she lands up with what we call iatrogenic infertility. And this is infertility caused by the knife of the surgeon. Um, because every time you operate in the pelvis, you do two things. You cause scar tissue and you reduce the number of normal eggs inside the ovary. Every time someone operates on the ovaries, you're bound to remove with the abnormal tissue some normal tissue. So you reduce that number of eggs in the ovaries. And we've discussed before that a woman has a finite number of eggs. And when that number runs out, her reproductive life, life is finished. So you so need can actually to be doing more harm. Absolutely. And most of the time you are, especially in, 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 in the wrong hands. And you need to have a pelvic conservative surgeon who operates on a woman who has endometriosis, somebody who respects um, fertility, because you can do a hell of a lot more damage operating on a woman with endometriosis than good. Um, that's really one of the huge take-home messages I always try and give, that surgery is not the first-line management for endometriosis. If you've got any questions about infertility, you can send them through on 34519, that's the SMS line, or you can WhatsApp us on 062 one four eight two three seven four and what's so nice about the new, having the whatsapp number is that you can uh, whatsapp us from anywhere in the world you can send us pictures you can send us audio you can send us memes maybe not for this topic though <laughs> All right, uh, I'm Kathy Kayla. My guest is Dr. Yossi Unterslack. He's a gynecologist. He's a fertility assistant at Vita Lab, and uh, we're inviting your your questions. Although this is a very very big topic, so. Endometriosis, you said, is very, very common um, an issue in infertility. Absolutely. Um, is there any other factor that we need to mention when we're talking about the causes of female infertility? I think that the, the, the big factors that I've mentioned here. You said are, age. Uh, and age, age was such a number age one. Age is really a big factor because the other. What, just to stress what I mentioned before is that. A chronological age does not always relate to ovarian age, and that's very important. So while, you know, a woman says, let me complete my studies, climb the career ladder, and then I'll have my babies after 35, she could very well be one of those women who, at 35, her potential is almost nil. So that's that's something that we really need to consider. Um, and, you know, it, it really doesn't take much to have a fertility assessment. And we also, these days, have the luxury of preserving fertility, almost putting our fertility on ice. And I don't know if we can discuss maybe I think we should. fertility preservation, which is... It's, it's been in the news a lot lately where, you know, celebrities, before going in to have uh, chemotherapy or whatever therapies they're having, is that they are actually freezing either their, their sperm or their ovaries. And there's, there's other cases around that as well, where, you know, the... The couple eventually separate, and the woman wants to use, you know, the sperm and the egg for a child, Absolutely. and the husband won't. And yeah, it's a huge. So there's a, there's a huge legal and ethical minefield, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yes, you, you mentioned medical conditions. So certainly, um, you, young people who have cancers. Um, should be freezing their sperm and their eggs because we know how toxic chemotherapy and radiation is to sperm and eggs. And um, yes, often the, the sperm and the eggs can recover, but often they don't. And if you have a young person with a cancer, they definitely should consider freezing their eggs or their sperm. But we've also got the, 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 the technology today to um, take a young girl who is not ready to start a family and won't be for the next while or hasn't met the right person and isn't ready to start a family. And she can go and freeze her eggs and put her eggs in the laboratory 
on ice, um, frozen in liquid nitrogen, so we don't rely on uh, electricity to keep the eggs frozen because that wouldn't be safe in this country. And um, and she could really come back for 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 those eggs whenever she's ready. Um, so it's it's really a luxury that that people need to consider because you, the the hardest conversation for me is to sit across the desk from a 35 year old who's now decided it's time to start a family and it's just too late. So the best time to freeze your eggs is before 35, but certainly up to up upwards of 40, 41, 42, we are still freezing eggs. We know the potential in those eggs is less at 41 than it is at 35, but there's certainly better potential at 41 than there is at 45. So whenever you make that decision, it's important because you are essentially freezing your potential at that age. And you can always come back to eggs of that age. And it doesn't mean you need to use those eggs. You may freeze your eggs when you're 30 and conceive naturally at 33 or 34 or 35. Those eggs will be there should you need them. But if you don't have them, and you now come and have that difficult conversation, then, you know, if you don't have those eggs frozen and you can't fall pregnant, then you're really um, in a difficult position because we need to start talking then about third-party eggs. Is Is there an obligation if one has frozen eggs or sperm, you know, and you don't use it? I mean... Is it ethical to destroy them? I mean, what is is there a protocol? So, so look, I mean, it's obviously dependent on, from patient to patient, religion to religion. So, I'll see many patients of. Um, Let's all talk about faiths. Judaism. Okay. So, so, so in Judaism, I'm, I'm not a rabbi. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll stress that from the outset because I often do get halakhic questions related to infertility. And as much as I do have um, the knowledge behind me, I don't like to make a ruling. But it, it, it is encouraged to freeze eggs in a woman who is um, getting older and hasn't had any children. Um, freezing sperm is a little bit more of a, of a halakhic conundrum. Right. Um, but it, it, certainly but it, somebody it, it who's going to... speaks to intention, to, though. Absolutely. It? Well... Yes and no. Okay. Um, so it, it depends really who you ask. As you know, it, with all things um, um, halakhic, um, there's different opinions. But certainly in a young guy who's going to have chemotherapy, that's definitely something that needs to be considered. Um, freezing sperm, the, 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 the male factor or male infertility does not is not impacted as much by age as female infertility. And... That being said, I mean, uh, we know uh, Christian Barnard, who was having children well in 270s. So a man's ability to, con- to, to, to make a woman pregnant lasts a lot longer. So the, the fertility preservation for a male is more related to medical conditions like cancer, but not necessarily to the man who's getting older and is worried that he won't be able to have a child because he's, you know, getting on in years. But from a female point of view, freezing eggs is really, really important um, before it, it, before we get to that point where it's just too late. At what point does a couple or an individual, because today people want to have children outside of relationships, Absolutely. which I think has its own challenges anyway, but uh, at what point does a couple say, you know what, I think we need to see a fertility expert. Okay, so it's an excellent question. And Under the age of 35, we generally encourage couples to try at least for a year before they say they need help. So off the pill? Off, off the pill, regular, unprotected intercourse for a year. Um, up to a year could be normal for a couple under 35, unless there are other factors that are concerning. So if a woman's got very heavy, painful periods, if she misses periods and has long 60-day cycles, if there's anything else that's contributing to the anxiety, they should be investigated before a year. They shouldn't wait. So uh, under 35, normal regular periods, regular unprotected intercourse, you can allow for up to a year before you say, hang on, things are going wrong here. Over 35, we don't want you to try for more than six months because over 35, the age factor is really, really important. And every six months that you wait can make it more and more difficult to get pregnant. So, um, again, uh, over 35, at least six months, unless there are other contributing factors. So in a woman who's over 35 who has long cycles or heavy periods, painful periods, there's no reason to wait for six months before being investigated. The worst thing you can do is have an investigation, be told everything's fine, going. Keep, keep keep going at your homework for another six months, but there's the, although you do often hear that. Okay. Anyway, carry on, carry on. So, then, so yeah. yeah so, so what I was saying is that um, that you know there's, there's no harm in having an assessment and being told everything's fine. Keep trying. But you don't want to leave it, put it off, and then in six months' time, when you do decide to be investigated, you've missed the boat. Okay. Um, what I was referring to is often you'll hear a couple. And they, they have undergone 
years of fertility treatment. They eventually, they give up for whatever reason. They adopt and boom. They get pregnant. They get pregnant. Absolutely. How does that, why does that work like so that? It's, there's no scientific explanation really. And um, that's what I love about what we work, what we do. Because very often I'll see a couple and I'll, think to myself because I've learned now not to verbalize it but I've thought to myself this is a couple that yeah, I'm it's not just us talking pregnant. there's nobody actually yeah, listening course. to this <laughs> but you'll look at a uterus or look at a woman's pathology or man's and think this is a couple that need intervention and the next month they'll call you back and say doctor my period's late I've done a pregnancy test and I'm pregnant so we're always surprised um, and we don't understand what it is that when a couple stop trying you know, suddenly she falls pregnant. But yeah. we know many stories. We also know many stories of women who of, of couples who try for many years and then eventually they have their IVF, they have their baby, and then their next babies come very easily. And that we we do believe that pregnancy does wonders for fertility. It kind of resets the fertility, uh, um, does a hard reboot on the system, and pregnancy itself can often overcome a lot of the a lot of the problems. But the challenge is sometimes just getting to that first pregnancy. Um, but there's, there's obviously something psychological about a couple who make that decision but and accept that they're not going to have their own children and, mm. then they, and then they go and fall pregnant. And people ask me all the time, so how much, what kind of role does stress play in this process? You know, if I stop stressing, will I fall pregnant easier? And we know that it certainly plays a role, but how do you take that stress away? Because that stress is about the baby. And until that baby comes, you cannot take that stress away. And, you know, daily stress. Does that play a role, you know, worrying about the bills and worrying about, um, you know, the, the markets and things like that? It probably does play a role as well. But again, you can't remove yourself from your environment and say we're going to go and live on an island for six months and make a baby because we're going to be stress-free over there. It, it, it's not it's reality, not unfortunately. You know, infertility is nothing new. Nothing. That's it. We Any spoke time, about it this week in the Pasha. Yeah. <laughs> Any time you want to know the source of something, you go back to the first time it's mentioned in the Torah. And the first time that infertility is mentioned in the Torah was is with Rachel, with our foremother, Rachel. She eventually became the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. But she cried. She cried to have, to have children. Um, she was teased. She was mocked. A very, very difficult situation. Plus, she's got to share her husband. You know, yeah. I know, I know what you did for her. <laughs> for her, you gave her four children. <laughs> I can exactly. hear the conversation in my head. In fact, it even goes back before then. I yeah. can't believe Sarah. that I missed that to yeah. Sarah. That was Sarah was, how old was she? She was 95. 99. 99. Yeah, those were, those were some interesting ovaries. Apparently, she didn't even have a uterus. That's right. That's what the Torah says. We're still trying to work out how she got pregnant without a uterus. Well, you know, it will really advance our field. If God is omnipotent, then... Exactly. You know, it's, it's a very exactly. interesting... Uh, very interesting debate. Also, I mean, one of the most famous stories as well is uh, the story of Hannah. Hannah, she's, uh, she's praying, and she's praying at the wall. And because she's mouthing her words, the high priest, uh, Eli, thinks that she's been drinking. And he calls her out. And uh, because she was actually so sincere, she has a son by the name of Samuel who became the prophet who anointed the kings of Israel. Exactly. Which is just, yeah. a, it's an amazing, amazing thing. So how important is a spiritual dimension when a couple is going through fertility treatment? We're going to be tackling that question right after this. Medical Monday is proudly brought to you with the compliments of Discam. Pharmacists to care. I'm Kathy Kayla. Thank you so much for joining me for the Discam Medical Monday. If you've missed the beginning part of the show, you'll definitely want to go and download it. You can get to highfm.com and download the podcast. That'll be later on this afternoon. My guest is uh, Dr. Yossi Unterslack. He's a gynecologist. He's a fertility assistant at Vita Lab, and we are talking about infertility and fertility. Now, uh, just before we took that break. I asked him about the spiritual component because I think that, you know, having a child, it is a spiritual experience, very much so. In fact, a lot of people become more observant. They they um, become more in touch with the creator when they have children. All of a sudden, those big questions need to, need to be answered. And I think that it works the other way as well is that one would probably need to draw closer to God if one is having trouble conceiving. How important is is it to have that relationship or is it not really? Is it all signs? Look, 
as a scientist, you'd expect me to say it's all science. But well, you're we a scientist see it. who wears a kippa, so <laughs> that's but why I thought it's absolutely. appropriate to ask you. But we see it every day. We see situations every day where we cannot give you a scientific answer why a woman can't or has fallen pregnant. Um, and there's definitely a place for spirituality. There's definitely a place for prayer. There's definitely a place for, you know, uh, interceding on high. And, um, you know... The, the the big question we always get is well then if that's the case if 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 you will only have your child when God desires it when the time is right well then why go through the treatment just sit back and it will happen when it's supposed to happen so that's the question that I'm often asked in my practice you know should are we, are we intervening are we are we are we trying to force God's hand because we know we can't do that and maybe we should just leave it all leave it all alone so what's the answer so so so. The, 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 I mean, there's a there's a lot of ref- sources and there's a lot of stories that you know we see where you, we we know that we we can't sit back and just expect God to give us our miracles. We need to work for them too. We can't just sit back and expect to be you know handed. And if the science and the technology exists, it exists for a reason. So that's also God given. Absolutely. Yeah. So so there are there are many many religions who um, will not who will refuse to have fertility treatment you know we'll see deeply deeply religious catholics who will not have ivf who will not intervene and judaism sees things completely the other way we see ourselves as that we are partners in creation and um as much as um the god will determine when when and if it works um we can't sit back and say well then we're going to just sit back and wait for it to happen um you know and and, and th- that's that's the message that i give my patients and that's you know so you you need to stay connected spiritually you need to pray you need to be involved with rabbi and seek that kind of spiritual uh, guidance um but you also need to actively um you know seek the cure which is which is the the rvf or the or the ICSI or whatever it is happens to be that you need um at the same time and yes god will determine the time and god will determine whether it whether it's successful or not um uh, but but you you need to really be making that effort as well, Doctor Unslack. Let's talk about the different forms of fertility treatments. Okay, so uh, okay. what are the what are the you've referenced IVF a lot. Yes. What is IVF? Okay, so IVF stands for in vitro fertilization, and essentially what it means is fertilizing eggs with sperm in a laboratory. So um, that is pretty much the, the 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 main treatment as far as infertility is concerned there are other things and then that's placed then. into the woman and so, she basically carries the term yeah so what hopefully. we do so what we do with rvf is each month a woman will ovulate with one egg and she will lose a great number of eggs depending on what 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 kind of egg reserve she has but every month a, a good number of eggs will be lost and one will one will fertilize one will one will become mature and, and a woman will ovulate with that egg so what we do with rvf is we maximize the potential of that cycle so if a woman is going to lose 15 eggs that month we try and maximize and make sure that all 15 of those eggs grow through to become mature and we remove them from the ovary so we extract those eggs from the ovary on the same day that we take the eggs out of the woman's ovaries we get sperm from the male and we then do rvf where we um, prepare the eggs in a certain way and the sperm in a certain way, put them in a dish in the laboratory, put them together in an incubator, close the incubator, and overnight they will do their thing. The, egg will, the, fer- eggs, the sperm will fertilize the egg, and then for five days we watch those embryos grow in the laboratory. So we, the, we'll look the next day to see that they're fertilized normally, we'll look two days later to see that they're ongoing and developing, and then on the fifth day an embryo should look a certain way. On the fifth day of the embryo's life we either put that embryo back inside a woman's uterus, one or two, depending on their age and their circumstances. Um, And the other embryos, the surplus embryos, we can then freeze. Some cycles we don't transfer embryos at all. We freeze all of the embryos and transfer them at a later stage. But that's essentially how we do IVF. Um, It's it's a pretty... um, I wouldn't say it's a it, it, it's it's not, it's 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 a pretty painless process for the female. Um, extracting the eggs is painful, but we put them to sleep for that period. They, they they do need to inject themselves every day, sometimes twice a day. So with hormones. Yes, with certain hormones that encourage the egg growth, um, and also block ovulation because we don't want them to ovulate until we're ready for those eggs to ovulate. So they do need to inject themselves every day, and it's certainly not an easy process to go through. But it's, it's not an overly scary scary process to have to go through. Um, so that's that's IVF. There's a there's a there's a side to IVF called ICSI, which is 
um, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or ICSI. And what we do with ICSI, and that's especially for male fat infertility. Instead of putting the sperm and the eggs together in a dish overnight and allowing the sperm to fertilize the eggs, we assist the fertilization in the laboratory. So what do we do? We put the sperm in a fluid, in a, almost a jelly, which slows the sperm down because they're really quick, difficult to catch. We then pick up the sperm tail first, not we. I'm saying it like it's me, but I've got very skilled scientists who work in our laboratory who do that for <laughs> us. thinking how you pick but up the I tail But I certainly am not good out. enough to catch the sperm by its tail, but we've got excellent scientists, embryologists who do that for us. So they catch the sperm with a needle which is 16 times thinner than the human hair. And they'll catch that sperm and inject the sperm into the egg and thereby assist the fertilization. Because this is in cases where the, 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 male, the male fact is so severe that the sperm will not fertilize the egg in the laboratory or in or It hasn't in even the got the strength to go through that little it's not so much the strength it, it doesn't is. have the numbers so okay. sperm, sperm are like the, the bullies on the playground they hunt in packs and uh, one single sperm on its own cannot fertilize an egg it needs a good number of normal sperm behind it I'm seeing, it the, I'm seeing the opening um, what movie was it I think it was Look Who's Talking where the entire opening montage of is the of the sperm swimming and for fertilizing this That's egg. It. And, and it sounds like the soundtrack that they've got is these kids on a playground <laughs> and they're chasing each other. So well, that's, that's, that's what I'm That's, that's what exactly I'm what it is. And, and so, so the sperm need a good a high concentration of normal sperm in order to fertilize one egg. And if we, don't, we can't achieve those numbers, we need to go and do ICSI where we inject the sperm inside the egg and, and, and get fertilization by means of, 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 of ICSI. So those are your two big laboratory treatments you know there are certain there are other, other things called gift and zift and we can go into those a bit um, what, but what is the success rate of uh, IVF and ICSI so it's obviously clinic dependent it's obviously pathology dependent right. so you can't say a blanket rule to each every person you know our unit our clinic may have a 50 55% success rate but you couldn't assign that success rate to all couples you know if you've got a 42 year old who's got one egg left and he's got one sperm wrapped in elastoplast they're not going to have a 50% chance of getting pregnant with each cycle their right. chance will be will be far less but the, the overall success rate at our unit is somewhere around 55% um, obviously included in that are cycles where we use egg donation or sperm donation and things like that um so you know if you looked at at at, at, at international figures that would be pretty high 55 percent you're looking more somewhere between 30 40 percent success rate per cycle but it's very much clinic dependent country dependent pathology dependent so it's difficult to give an overall success rate and i rather give my success rates to my couples in front of me you know to say you're going to walk away with this chance because that's what we say on our website. Our clinic offers a 55% success rate. It's often not the case. You need to tailor that potential to each couple. So in some couples it might be higher, some Absolutely. it might be lower. So if you've got a young couple with blocked fallopian tubes, their potential is much better. But if you've got an old couple with very few eggs, very few sperm, very poor quality eggs, obviously you're not going to give them a 55% chance of taking a baby with the first IVF cycle. You mentioned gift. What's gift? So gift is... Um, it, it's kind of an older technology which is slowly coming back now um, where we um, very, much, <laughs> yeah, very much like IVF where we stimulate the ovaries to make lots of eggs. We then extract the eggs from the ovaries, prepare them in a catheter with prepared sperm and reintroduce those sperm and eggs into the fallopian tube. And essentially what we're doing is saying to the fallopian tube, you be our incubator for the next five days. You do the work that we would have done in the laboratory for the next five days. The reason it gives you a better chance than intercourse, for example, is that you've got a lot more eggs. So we, you would just have one egg per month. Gift, we can offer however many eggs the ovary will make. We obviously have to make a, a, a responsible decision how many eggs we put back. But we also then put the sperm and the eggs together in the fallopian tube. So it sounds like quite a natural process. So it, it is a lot more natural than, than RVF. A lot more of it takes place in the, in, in the body. We're really playing a numbers game when we do gift. We're taking, instead of one egg, six or seven eggs. So we're giving you six or seven times the chance. But we're also taking away those variables. Will the egg be released by the ovary? Will the fallopian tube catch the egg? Will the sperm meet the egg at the right time? We're kind of taking over those You're factors and those. we're making sure that those things take place, thereby, thereby giving you a much higher success rate. And uh, what was the other one that you mentioned? There was gift and then there was... Then there's uh, Zift. Zift is, Zift is what we do for for male fact infertility and um, what we do essentially is we'll do uh, like we've done um, stimulate the ovaries take the eggs out do that ICSI process where we inject the sperm into the egg because mm. that's where the problem is for these couples the male factor and then once the eggs are fertilized the next morning we'll go and put the fertilized eggs back inside the fallopian tube 
Okay. So, so it's, you make it sound so simple. But it's really not. No, I think it's for not. any for any for any couple that's that's gone through Absolutely. this, it's not simple at all. Why no. is it so expensive? So, everything we use in our laboratory is imported. Um, so, imported. but around the world, uh, fertility treatments are yeah, expensive. Yeah, so, so 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 that is the the big issue is you know everything's driven by consumer numbers. So obviously the drugs that are more commonly used are cheaper because the company can make a smaller margin on those things. So. It's a small population. So it's it's economy a, of scale. Of course, it's a small number of the population that need to have IVF. So, the drugs are expensive. The consumables in the laboratory are expensive. The dishes, the, the media that we grow the, the embryos in, and then we invest huge money into our laboratories. We've got equipment that's worth a million rand a piece. So those kind of things need to be paid for. So you've got skilled scientists in the laboratory who are working with the eggs and the sperm, and that's really why the process is so expensive. So uh, what would you say to, to couples who are considering fertility treatment? They're listening now. They've been trying for 18 months to try and have a, you know, have a natural pregnancy. It's not working. They're listening to this now, either live or on podcast. What would you say to them? So the, the, the first thing is that we, at, well, certainly we at VitaLab, try and make this experience as comfortable for you as possible. And there's no harm in having an assessment and being told, we don't find anything wrong, keep trying. But we don't want to sit with you when the, when, 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 when the horse is already bolted and now have to try and, you know, uh, sell the concept of donor sperm or donor eggs to you or try and, um, you know, f- if you do IVF with a very, very poor poor potential. So rather make that move early, have that as investigations early, see if there's a problem and deal with it early that rather than waiting, leaving it till it's too late. And it, 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 it is, it's, it's very scary to have to take that step to then, you know, say, admit defeat in a way that we are not able to do this on our own and we need the help that we, you know, that, that's available. Yeah, because so it's such an intimate part. That's of exactly what it is, and we, and 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 we that's that's what's what what needs to be, you know, what, what needs to be told is that we try and make this process as easy for you as possible, and that's, you know, that that that's that's really what's most important because there's an invasion on your privacy, there's a massive invasion on your intimacy, you know. If we're not doing IVF, we're doing things like timed intercourse. You've got to go home and be on the clock and ten o'clock tonight, and it's really it, it's a it's, it's any a process. romance absolutely all goes window. out the window, yeah. and 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 that has to be stressed and that has to be appreciated by the doctors looking after you because we don't want it to become all about science. You don't want to completely destroy a couple's intimacy, and it, it's not what having a baby should be about. Um, so you need to be very very conscious of those kinds of things, and. Just to go back to your question, I think the important thing is rather do the investigations early, find out that there's no problem and go back to trying on your own than have to have a very difficult conversation down the line when that boat has already sailed. Dr. Yossi Unterslack, thank you very, very much for coming in today. Um, It's been an absolute pleasure. You really know your stuff and you've got such a wonderful way of putting across difficult topics and uh, Thank you very, very much. That's uh, Dr. Yossi Unterslack. He's a gynecologist and he's a fertility assistant at Vita Lab. And uh, yeah, get to their website, go check it out. This has been Discam Medical Monday. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to speaking to you next week. So uh, until then, same time, same place. God bless. Bye. Medical Monday is proudly brought to you with the compliments of Discam.